this is a recorded lecture for November 5th. We're going to finish chapter 16 and then move on to chapter 17. Uh, there are only a couple slides left in chapter 16. We left off talking about the origin of flight. And hopefully you remember that our conclusion is that birds did not fly from trees down, but that flight developed from the concept of ground up. We're going to talk a little bit more about this. So if it was trees down, which had been the dominant tree theory for quite some time, the idea was the bird ancestors were tree climbers who jumped from branch to branch. And the wing was a structure that developed to help create lift, which would aid them in jumping further and also their accuracy in jumping. We do see arboreal lizards in the East Indies who have flaps of skin that can act like wings similar to the way that we see flaps of skin working for quote unquote flying squirrels. However, there's a big difference to sticking out your arms to utilize your skin flaps to glide from place to place when you compare um, compared to flapping of your front limbs in order to move from place, place to place. The gliding stage may have some weak kind of flapping motion in it as the organism realizes that they're missing where they're headed, but the transition from gliding to fully airborne flapping flight is a massive change. Let's look at ground up from a moment, a moment instead. This suggests that flight came from running. That the ancestors were fast runners and that wings, really front limbs at that point, helped to increase lift and lighten the load for running. Flapping aided in additional forward motion. But flapping is not necessarily the most effective way of running faster because in order to run, you need traction. You need to have some sort of friction between your feet and the ground surface. And if you're half flying, half running, you are lifting your body from the ground and you're not going to have that friction. When we look at Archaeopteryx and some of the other ancient birds that we'll see in a few moments, we see that they did still have claws with talon-like structures on them, that they pursued their prey and likely still killed them with their forelimbs. Wings were used to help trap prey items, and that perhaps the modifications of them were then for subduing larger prey items. So the wings didn't develop for flight at first. Flight is later a byproduct of wing development. Wings likely did assist in horizontal jumps, jumps while going after prey items, and they helped the organism while jumping to control whether or not they were rolling, what type of pitch their body was on, or if they were going sideways while leaping. So those wings were helpful in jumping, similar to how a tightrope walker is going to have their arms out to assist with balance. So the wings were a balance assist. Wing-assisted incline running is seen in birds, that they do outstretch their wings in order to help run uphill because it does help create some lift. So the ground up theory is by far the dominant theory today. For more information on this, I'm once again gonna suggest that you're reading along in your textbook. Body size and flight are related as well. The terrestrial origin of flight seems consistent um, with Multiple, uh, multiple lines of evidence. The wrists and the wings are good for grabbing prey, but when we look at that idea of from trees down, the wrists and the wing structures that we see in ancient birds would actually be very bad for grabbing tree branches. The relationship between body size and flight is that things that fly have kind of a maximum body size that they can really be. Wing loading 
is the weight of the bird divided by the surface area of the wing. At a certain point, the bird is just too large to get off of the ground with the wings that they have. So with the evolution of flight, we see a reduction in body size of our birds and our bird-like dinosaurs. Larger birds do need proportionally larger rings than smaller birds in order to have a good wing loading number. Which brings us to Archaeopteryx and some of the other birds. Archaeopteryx is our earliest known bird or potentially last known dinosaur, somewhere there kind of in between. Um, the birds, generally speaking, from a phylogenetic standpoint, include Archaeopteryx and everything since then. Archaeopteryx did have wing feathers with an outer set of primaries and an inner set of secondary feathers, almost identical to the way we see these structures in extant birds. So you'll see what I mean by primary and secondary feathers in a few minutes when we talk about chapter 17. And like birds that we have today, the veins of the feathers for Archaeopteryx were, the feathers themselves were asymmetrical in relationship to the vein. So instead of having the same amount of feather on either side of the vein, which is that middle hollow portion of the feather, there was one side that had more feather material on it than the other. We see that this is true in birds today, but as I mentioned on Friday, for most of our dinosaurs that were feathered, they had symmetrical feathers. So how well did Archaeopteryx fly? The skeletal proportions and feathers seem pretty similar to its stand birds, so we should assume that it flew okay. But it likely needed to run in order to take flight. It probably could not just get itself up in the air by flapping its wings alone. And this is true of some of our larger birds today as well, especially things like an albatross. When you look at them, they need room to take off and they cannot just, like a sparrow, jump into the air and have their body be carried by their wings. Archaeopteryx was a ground-dwelling predator that would leap into the air to seize prey it probably flew rapidly for a short distance, and then it would not perhaps crash land when it came to ground, but that it would be running as it came back to the ground. We see this idea of running to take off and moving while coming back to the ground in some of our bird groups today. And there are some of our birds that do only fly rapidly for a very short distance. Things like chickens are only capable of very small flight. So what do we see in these pictures? We have these two competing ideas of from the tr tree down or from the ground up. And once again, ground up was correct. And then this is the fossil evidence of Archaeopteryx on some of our earlier birds. You can see the feather imprints all around it, and you can see a body that is not perhaps entirely like a bird today. Notice that the um, feather may, or the tail, may still have considerable bone in it. It may not be as completely um, derived as the pygostyle style that we see in birds today, but that there is a relationship here between a bird skeleton and this fossilized dinosaur skeleton. The last thing here is a little bit more about our crocodilians. They, uh, as you remember, are large, heavily armored. They have bony plates and scales forming their armor. They have elongated snouts, powerful tails. Their teeth are set into their sockets well. They have webbed feet. And the nostrils on the top of their snout, they can close with valves. They're pretty unique in their lung structure in their abdominal cavity, the use of the liver for respiration. They do have a four-chambered heart, but we saw they can change their blood flow patterns. And in case you're trying to figure out, is that creature I just saw an alligator or a crocodile, you can use these two hints here. Alligators generally have a broader snout, crocodiles more pointed, but if the mouth is closed with no visible teeth, alligator, when the mouth is closed, if the fourth tooth and lower jaw is visible, you have a crocodile. So 
So here we have our American alligator. Lots of them here for your viewing pleasure. We have our Chinese alligator, spectacled caiman, American crocodile. And you can see the close up there of the American crocodile, his teeth outside of his mouth, same as the Nile crocodile and the Arnico crocodile. That is the end of this chapter. I'm gonna switch over to chapter 17. That brings us to avian specializations, chapter 17. For those of you that have had ornithology, some of this will be review information, some of this will be new as we go through. So our avians are our birds. And when you look at birds, overall, their defining characteristic is flight. This doesn't mean though that every bird can fly. Ostriches, emus, kiwis, penguins, rheas, those are not birds who fly. And there are many birds that are extinct that also either did not fly much or did not fly. There are though mechanical requirements for, for flight that shape the anatomy, physiology, behavior, and ecology of birds. They have hollow bones. They have no teeth. Their digestive system is remarkably modified with a crop and a gizzard, as opposed to, uh, as a way of making up for the lack of teeth. They have different options though from your terrestrial animals. They can fly, which allows them to migrate long distances pretty quickly. And they're gonna navigate very differently than some of the organisms we've talked about so far, and much differently from a lot of our mammals. So their wings are modified for flight, for swimming, for running. Feet are very well modified for the lifestyle that they have as well. And our birds that do not fly are secondary flightless birds. Birds are generally gonna be diurnal, but some of them are nocturnal, and then a large number of them are also crepuscular. So their different lifestyles are gonna depend upon where they live, what the food supply is like, what predators are like. And some of our nocturnal birds are nocturnal because their predators are diurnal or they're crepuscular because their predators are diurnal. And your large birds of prey are one of the main groups of diurnal birds. The early birds and do have a lot of similarities to our stand birds. Flight offered them a whole host of new opportunities though. You could escape from a predator in a completely different way. You could get food sources that might have been off limits to you before. You could find shelter completely off the ground easily. You could also attack prey in a new way. But Archaeopteryx, as we saw, didn't look like our first or didn't look like a, a real bird in the same way that we think of birds today, skeletally at least. It was a bipedal dinosaur that could fly some, but real birds have very distinct anatomical differences from Archaeopteryx and from those early dinosaur-like birds. <coughs> Excuse me. Their center of gravity is shifted forward towards the wings. The bony tail I mentioned um, in the Archaeopteryx picture, that's gone. Instead, there is the fused vertebrae at the base of the tail called a pygo style, and that is where the feathers are going to attach in that form their tail. So bird tails are going to be feathers as we see the tail portion, and their tailbone is fused um, similarly to the way that our tailbone is part of our, our spine and pelvic area. Their shoulder girdle has strut-like coracoids that help to resist the pressures exerted by flight muscles because the flight muscles are going to be remarkably strong muscles. And without these structures, they could otherwise um, perhaps injure themselves and they need to have a way to keep these very strong muscles in place. They have a reduction of claws on their feet, which is better for perching. You don't want to have a claw that's going to puncture the other side of your foot when you grasp around a branch or something like that. They have large sternums 
which provide more area for flight muscles to attach to, and their wrist is capable of bending backwards in order to tuck the wing against the body. This is showing you a reconstruction of one of the early birds in A, Norius, and then in B we have D, a uh, fossilized imprint of Confecurinus. Um, sorry, con. Mm. Confecurinus. Uh, that's the best pronunciation I'm going to get for you today. <laughs> Apologies. But you can see that they are looking more like birds than Acryopteryx did. But you should note that there is still a rudimentary tail in there. And we're not going to see that in things like our normal birds, particularly if you were to look at your chicken skeleton, which you all did earlier this semester, you didn't see a distinct tail feature. This is looking at bird evolution from the Mesozoic to the modern birds. We won't likely have time to look at, well, we don't have time to look at all of these groups, but we will see that there are um, some groups we'll have a little bit of time to look at. For those of you um, looking up there, the word passerines and non-passerines, that's dealing with whether they're your normal songbird, that would be a passerine. If they're not, they usually fit in that non-passerine category. Um, but some of your birds that are flightless are gonna fit in um, the uh, ratites category instead. We can talk about an overall bird structure but depending upon the lifestyle of the bird, some of these overall things are not quite right. All of our birds are gonna have beaks, but each of the beaks is gonna be modified for the feeding style that that group uses. For example, we have some birds that are going to be able to kill prey outward with their beak. Others are gonna be able to slash at their prey. Others are gonna have a hook structure, some will not. Some will have beaks that are good for shearing flesh, others will not, um, and generally most of them can't shear flesh off of it. They might be able to pull it apart. Others have beaks that are, suitify, that are better suitable for taking the husk off of seeds or for eating insects. Their feet are gonna fit their locomotion style, their perching style, and their hunting style, and those are going to influence each other. Birds that have great perching abilities with their feet are not likely to use their feet to doing a lot of hunting. Their intestinal tracts are different depending upon their feeding style and particularly depending upon whether they eat a lot of meat or if they eat a lot of seeds or a lot of fruit or a lot of green vegetation. The wing shape is gonna reflect flight style but the morphology is still gonna be pretty uniform here compared to our mammals and even some of our, our reptile groups. I mentioned this a few minutes ago that flight does impose a maximum body size because larger birds are just heavier birds and they're harder to get in the air, which means they need to have bigger wings. At a certain point, they may not be able to get off the ground. Some of them are gonna use takeoff runs or jumps from trees or other types of ways in order to get in the air. Whereas your smaller birds are gonna be capable of just kind of jumping into the air and flapping and they'll stay there. For some of your large birds, taking off requires difficulty. They might need a runway where they run along it and they flap their wings as they do so to get off of the ground. We see the great Cory uh, Bustard here, who uh, weighs 10 kilograms. It's our largest flying bird. It's shown with zebras in the background. And it needs a huge runway in order to get off of the ground. It is related to the storks and vultures. I'm sorry. Um, the great Cory Bustard it has this huge runway. The largest bird that we are ever aware of a flying was the uh, Argentavis, which has a seven foot wingspan. This is the one that's related to your storks and vultures. 
with a mass, we believe, of 70 kilograms. It would climb cliffs and launch itself from a cliff. And it spent most of its time in the air, similar to some of our large seabirds, like the albatross, who spend much of their time on the air. Because once you're in the air, it doesn't take much effort to stay there. It's getting in the air that is difficult for birds. Flightless birds can be larger, and their body proportions do not necessarily need to confirm to flight requirements, but they still don't tend to get as large as mammals. Ostriches get to 150 kilograms at maximum. The extinct elephant bird, which is our largest ever flightless bird, would be 450 kilograms at its absolute maximum, which is still remarkably smaller than an elephant, a hippopotamus, or a whale shark. But the body type is still going to be similar as you go from bird to bird to bird, regardless of how they fly or if they fly. This brings us to the concept of feathers and flight. Feathers are one of our defining characteristics of, um, sorry for that, of bird lifestyles. As I was saying, feathers are a necessity for flight for our birds. And feathers are, are quite uniform in their structures. We look across the different bird groups. Feathers are maintained on birds, even those who do not fly. And we see that there will be some modifications to the bird to feathers as we go through. Some groups have more of some types and fewer of others but feathers are all quite uniform. They develop from follicles in the skin. In that way, they are similar to the idea of hair, but they are arranged generally in tracks. Um, the terrelae, there are some that do not have them in tracks. Few birds have their feathers that are uniformly distributed all over the body. This is true of the penguins, the mouse birds, and the ratites, that they're Feathers are everywhere over the body as opposed to these uniform tracks. And some birds have areas of their skin that are unfeathered. We call these areas apteria. This is on some of the birds. These are their structures called brood patches. These brood patches are bare areas of the skin. And this is what they will press against their eggs as they are brooding them to keep the eggs warm because having the feathers there would actually get in the way of passing body heat off to the eggs. Chemically, feathers are composed of 90% beta carotin, 1% lipid, 8% protein, and the remaining about 1% is made of proteins and pigments. The color of feathers is gonna depend upon the pigments as well as the structure of the feather itself. So here you can see where some of the feather tracks would be in a bird similar here to like a sparrow. And now we're gonna look at feather types for a few moments. The first thing is that we need to talk about the feather anatomy itself. The base of the feather that is anchored into the skin is the calamus. The rachis is the long tapered body of the feather. And then the feather, you notice this, most of you, if you've picked up feathers probably, that they are kind of zipped or Velcroed together, the different portions of, of the feather. Um, the barbs and barbules are gonna be on the edges of the feather that allow them to stay hooked together. When you see birds move their beak through the feather, they're grooming it. They're resetting these barbs and barbules. Our bodies of birds are covered in contour feathers. The base of the feather is flexible and it tends to lack barbs because the base of the feather is for insulation. And because of this, it's gonna be the downy portion or the fluffy portion of the feather. This is the part that keeps the bird warm. You won't find this in their wing feathers generally because this is part of the body feathers. The downy portions of the feathers lack the barbs and barbules, so they're great for insulation, but not good for the structure necessary for flight. 
the vein is the portion with the barbs. Vein feathers um, can act as an airfoil to fight. They can act for protection. They may help in the shedding of water, of keeping the bird waterproof. Some affect or reflect, or I'm sorry, absorb or reflect solar radiation, which is gonna determine the color of the feather. And preening of the vein portion is what allows the birds to re-zip the barbs. And we call that preening when the bird is cleaning its feathers and using its beak or its feet, but normally its beak, to fix its feathers. The contour feathers are the body feathers, but we're also going to talk about the wing feathers, which are the regimens, as well as the tail feathers, and these tail feathers are the retrocedes. So here we are looking at some of the different feathers. You can see a generalized feather on the left side of the screen with the letter A next to it, the calmus, is the part that is attached to the skin. The ragus is the extension of the calmus as it goes up the rest of the feather. And the vein are the actual portions you tend to think of as feathers. You can see the zoom in there um, coming off of that, showing the barbules that, and, and the barbs being those sharp portions that are able to attach into each other to keep the feather tight together. If you look at B at the bottom of this picture, you will see the portion that it is um, showing to be plumaceous. That is going to be your down-like portion of the feather, and you can see that the rest of the vein is actually the barbs and barbules to be kept together. And C is showing a close-up of the barb and barbule structure. On the other side of the screen, A is showing you a semi-plume feather, B is showing a bristle, and C is showing a phyloplume. These three types of feathers look very, very different than our normal body contour feather. Uh, our retrocedes, once again, are your tail feathers, and your remedies are your wing feathers. Um, I may have said that they were related. They are the remedies I mentioned. I think two slides ago were um, body contour feathers as well. They may be included in that, but the regimens are really your wing feathers, and retrocedes are your tail feathers. These tend to be large and stiff feathers. They're the ones you generally find laying around um, that are modified when birds shed them and they're modified for flight. They may be tapered or notched. They may have gaps in them or slots in the feathers. These gaps and slots can actually reduce drag on the feather and thereby increasing lift of the bird. The semi-plumes that we just saw on the last slide are intermediate between contour and down feathers. They are generally hidden underneath the body. They help to cover the body to keep it warm or cool and to fill it out the body form because if you've ever seen a bird without its feathers it looks nothing like a feather covered bird does. And the down feathers are those plumaceous feathers. They provide insulation. The rachis is short and they have no barbs on them so all of the feather portions are remarkably fluffy. This is showing you a bird of prey with slotting visible in the outer primaries. You can see those gaps between the outer edges of the feathers. These slots are going to decrease drag and allow the bird to fly better. Then there are a few other types of feathers that are worth mentioning. Powder down feathers, apologies, I should say feathers, not fathers. Um, these powder down feathers break down into a white powder as the bird grooms with them. They, as they break down, this white powder is really the keratin granules coming off of the feather. They are best developed here in herons. 
and they help with making the feathers waterproof. This keratin granule is going to be a non-wetting layer, so it's going to keep water from becoming part in the, the feathers of the bird. The bristles were stiff, had a stiff rachis and barbs at the end, or they may have no barbs at the end. Bristles tend to be found along the bill and the eyes of the bird, as well as eyelashes near their head and near their toes. They are mostly dark color due to the amount of melatonin granules that are melanin granules that are in them. They are strong because of this melanin layer, resistant to wear and resistant to phytochemical damage. Their job is to screen out particles from the nostrils and the eyes. At least those no located near the nostrils and the eyes. Some of them may also provide tactile information back to the bird that as they move um, due to wind or due to something banging into it, that information is passed through the nervous system. And in some instances, bristles around the mouth may help to catch insects if the bird is especially an aerial forager. The phylo plumes are hair-like feathers with short barbs at the tip. They aid in filling out the bird, they aid in what the plumage looks like, but they're also not seen. A lot of our phyla plume, unlike the down, will help in aiding the operation of other feathers working um, correctly. For our birds, streamlining and weight reduction are very important to have a bird lifestyle. Streamlining requires that the body be smooth to move through the air. And that's important for flight because a smooth body structure is going to reduce drag and thereby it's going to make it easier to fly and easier to get off of the ground. Fast flight is going to require very little resistance. How fast are we talking? Your passerine songbirds generally get up to it at a maximum of 50 kilometers an hour. Ducks up to about 90 kilometers an hour, but the peregrine falcon can reach speeds of over 200 kilometers an hour while diving. So a smooth body is going to help increase flight speed. The contour feathers help to smooth the junctions of the body. So that the wing isn't just stuck onto the body, but there's a smooth line to it. And many of your birds, as they fly, you will see either tuck their feet into the body behind them, if their feet and legs are short, or with some of your herons or your large legged birds, may have the feet as an extension back behind the body because having feet hanging down from the body reduces your streamlining and makes it more energetically expensive to fly than if your body is more streamlined. But some birds do fly slowly. That's just the result of, of their body structure. Your long-legged, long-necked wading birds, like your gray blue heron, um, their necks are extended, their legs are trailing behind, they're going to be less streamlined than your average bird. But it doesn't mean that they are not good flyers. They're actually very good at flight. There are also some weight reduction strategies that our birds use. They lack a urinary bladder, so they're going to excrete their uric acid, and um, which means the birds are going to excrete things usually faster than other organisms. The females only have a left ovary, they've lost the right. And our birds in general have small gonads. During breeding season, the gonads go through hypertrophy in order to grow to a proper size. And then they reduce down again as um, the bird leaves breeding season. There are also some other changes to the digestive system that have helped with weight reduction that we'll talk about in a little bit. The skeleton, though, is very well modified for the life in the air of birds. It's a lighter skeleton than a mammal skeleton of the same size because the bones are filled with air. The skull is very light, and the distribution of mass is also a very important thing for the birds. They want to be sure that it's all distributed very well. The mass of your birds is concentrated in the hind limbs, and the leg bones of a crow could be heavier than the leg bones of a similar sized mammal, 
but the rest of its bones are much, much lighter. The skull, in fact, is remarkably light for birds. The pelvic girdle for birds is elongated. This is related to that increased mass in the hind areas, which helps with their center of gravity and everything like that. The tail, as we've already mentioned, is shortened into a pygostyle, that fusion of vertebrae, which supports tail feathers. And the pelvis has a rigid connection to the vertebral column. What you see at the bottom of this picture is a bird bone. You can see that the internal structures of the bone have a hollow core and that there are struts, S-T-R-U-T-S, that go across the bone to help create the strength of that bone. Because just a hollow bone would not be particularly strong. But by having the struts reinforcing it, it allows it to be strong and hollow. Their flexion in birds is actually reduced throughout the whole body compared to um, a mammal or, or a lizard. They're of the, for the spine, their flexion is only possible in the neck. Their sternum is enlarged and acts like a keel. A keel, um, if you're not familiar with that word, you can think of a rudder for navigation. Uh, it's going to help keeping them from rolling and things like that as they're in the air. The sternum is enlarged because it allows room for the attachment of the large flight muscles. The hind foot is elongated and the ankle joint is within the tarsal structure. Birds have four toes. They've lost the fifth toe. The tarsals and the metatarsals fuse together to form the tarsio-metatarsus structure. And your birds are digitigrade, meaning that they're walking with their toes flat on the ground. The knee joint is generally concealed by the feathers because it is close to the body. The fibula is the reduction, um, considerable reduction of the fibula, because it is more of a splint or a small portion of a bone than an actual full bone. And what you see in the picture here is a cartoon drawing of the skeleton of an eagle. Numbers 9 and 10 are showing you that reduced pygostyle. You can see um, 15, 16, and 17 showing you the connections um, with the sternum and that keel structure. And we're moving on to the avian wing. I'm going to tell you that we're going to skip over some information here. There are some slides that I don't think we're going to have time to cover. So if we're skipping over some things to expect, that would be why. The wing is going to function as both an airfoil and a propeller. So it's going to allow it to move through the air, similarly to an airplane wing, which is where that word airfoil is coming from, and propeller because it's going to be generating lift. Primary feathers in the wing are gonna do propulsion when they flap downwards. The secondary wing feathers are gonna be responsible for lift. The primaries are necessary, but birds can fly with a reduction of only 45% of their secondary feathers. You can see the primaries and the secondaries the secondaries are much closer into the body than the primaries are. The primaries in general are gonna be um, a portion of what is related kind of like to the hand and wrist, whereas the secondaries would be closer into the body. You can see that the bird is gonna be generating its propulsion when flapping down. As they flap down, they're gonna move upwards and forwards. Birds can change the area and the shape of their wing, and often do as they are, are flying. They may need to maneuver. They may need to change direction, to land, to take off. And they may need to change the position of the wing with respect to the body in order to do these things. So the, the wing has great ability to change its shape. And the wing is going to be moving forward through the air with a balance of lifting and drag. 
the lift is going to be the force that's going to be putting the bird into the air. They're going to be generating this. Drag is going to be gravity and air trying to keep the bird down. This is what the bird's going to be working against. Flapping flight in general is more complex than non-flapping flight. Um, but as the bird is dealing with lift and drag, the dorsal surface is going to be convex. The ventral is going to be concave. Um, and air pressure, oh. Apologies, let me start this one over. Um, the wing is moving forward through the air. As it does, the bird is gonna be changing the angle sometimes of the wing. As they increase the angle of the wing in proportion to um, their body, it's gonna increase more lift. As they bend the wing surface, they're gonna be creating more lift. So they're gonna be trying to create what you're seeing in D here in order to get more lift. C and D are, C is showing you that airfoil um, structure, but in D they're trying to get more lift. When the dorsal surface of the wing is convex and the ventral surface is concave, air pressure becomes unequal. Your air is gonna be moving at different speeds than over the wing. The air is gonna be moving faster over the dorsal portion that's gonna allow you to create more lift. The reason is that because as that air moves faster over the top portion, there's gonna be lower air pressure on top of the wing than there is below the wing. And that's kind of what you see here. So the air is gonna be moving faster over the top than it is over the bottom, which is gonna to help to generate more lift due to that unequalness of the air pressure. Birds tend to tilt the leading edge of their wing in order to create more lift. If they tilt downwards or leave their wing kind of flat as they're taking off or needing to move up in the air, what will happen is they can stall and then um, a stalled bird is generally going to start rapidly coming back down to the earth. Um, so they're going to change that tilt to increase their lift. Stalling is something you want to prevent. And for birds that are in the air for a long period of time, they may not always be capable of creating more and more lift um, because at a certain point they're too far up, they're too high in the atmosphere to be able to food or whatever it is that they're flying to look after. So stalling is going to be prevented or at least delayed by the slots or by having auxiliary air folds to the main wing. Because what slotting or auxiliary air folds are going to do is they're going to allow air from the top and the bottom to kind of mix below the wing. It's going to help to restore a smooth flow of air. We're going to see birds using this a lot during landing and takeoff generally because what happens is that each individual feather is actually its own airfoil and the way that you overlap them can change how each individual feather is creating lift or drag or assisting with stalling as you move through. You want smooth airflow from one wing feather from one feather to the next. Um, because as you have smooth airflow going from one to the next, it's going to reduce the amount of energy you're going to need. We also see that some fish swim in schools because as you're within the school, there's going to be actually a reduction of the amount of energy you need to keep moving forward because you're all going together. If you want a different example of this, um, I had someone once explain it to me that NASCAR drivers, will draft off of each other, utilizing the energy from the car in front of them to work together to reduce the amount of, I guess, gasoline they're using for their speed. Each of the feathers is kind of working like this by having the best lift you can from each feather and the smoothest 
surface, you're actually going to be reducing the amount of energy the bird needs to do its flight. And smooth airflow from one is going to go to the next, to the next, to the next, making it easier to fly. The wing tips, as the air comes off of the tips of the wing, can lead to the creation of air vortexes, as that air is going to tumble down off of the wing feathers. That is going to lead to the creation and or the inducement of drag, because the air is going to be mixing. And the way that birds generally handle this is actually done by their body structure. Their wings are tapered. Or if wings are very long, this is going to reduce the effect of these vertices, uh, vortexes, sorry, on the body structure itself. Wing loading, I mentioned this idea dealing with body size to wing structure, is really important here because the wings are well balanced for flight with the body mass in the right conditions. If a bird cannot overcome drag, it's not going to be able to lift itself off of the ground due to this wing loading concern. This brings us to talking about the hind limbs of birds. For the most part, um, we're dealing with legs. The ability to perch in trees appears to have been an early evolutionary feature of our birds. And on the ground, they tend to hop, walk, and run. In the water, they're capable of swimming and diving and they may use their feet for both of those, and some are gonna use their feet for hunting. Perching is actually a specialized, um, I'm gonna go with behavior for birds, and it is highly developed in your passerine birds. And the most specialized perching feet are found when all four toes are free, are mobile, and are of moderate length and similar length to each other usually. And pseudactyl is three toes forward, one toe backward. This is what is seen in a lot of our passerine birds. And they have a very firm grip as they grip around a tree branch or a wire or something like that. We'll see some of our birds, uh, especially our parrots and our woodpeckers, have zygodactylous toes with two forward and two backwards that allow them to climb and perch on vertical surfaces. And that's because they can have balance with those two toes in each direction. But what's interesting about perching birds are the tendons. Their tendons of their toes are what help to keep that very tight grip. So it's the tendons that are kind of pull everything into place that keeps the bird from falling off of a wire or a branch or things as a strong wind gust comes along. It, the muscles are involved, yes, but tendons are playing a very strong role here. As long as the legs are flexed and the toes are locked around the perch, the bird isn't just going to fall off. In order for the bird to uncurl its toes, it actually is gonna to need to extend the legs to stand up. So it's gonna to need to move the tendon by moving the bones in order to unlock the foot from that gripped position. Hopping, walking, running are all things that we see birds do. A hop is a succession of jumps with both legs moving together. Passerines either hop or walk depending upon the family they're in. Um, in general, birds that hop do not walk well and may not walk. Hopping may be the move that they use to get across the ground surface. Sparrows are hoppers. Walking is when you're moving your legs alternately with at least one foot in contact with the ground at all times. In hopping, both feet are off the ground or on the ground. Running is moving legs alternately with both feet off the ground at some times. And this is seen in your birds with long, thin legs and small feet usually, and they can cover a pretty large distance while running. Not all birds that can walk are capable of running though. There are modifications to this, um, hopping, walking, and running that include climbing and wading birds. And 
the mode of movement via heat or perhaps the bipedal mode of locomotion that a bird has may only be one of these ways. It may not be able to do everything else. And there are birds that can walk fast and some that can run slowly. So there may be some overlap in speed, but birds that can hop are not gonna be those that are capable of running. And here we see some different structures of bird feet. We see the highly modified foot of the ostrich with two toes and the rhea with three toes. The secretary bird's foot, which is your typical bird foot with three forward, one backward. And then a road runner's zygodactyl foot of two forward, two backward. All of these are birds that can run. But the first two have feet that are highly modified for running and walking. And um, I think we're gonna finish up um, with climbing and swimming as our last two things. So birds can use their feet, their tails, their beaks, and sometimes their forelimbs or their wings in order to climb. The way that they climb is going to be determined by group. Different groups or different families have different styles of climbing and different styles of foraging while on vertical surfaces. Your woodpeckers and your wood creepers uh, use their tail as a support. Their tail feathers are gonna be particularly strong compared to some of the other birds. They um, will forage near the base of trees and they will walk up the tree as they're foraging. They cling to the bark using their feet, but their tail is used as a prop to keep them upright. Nut hatches are very different. They can climb with their head pointing upward and their head pointing downward while foraging at the same time. This is, is something they're capable of because um, the backward directed toe has a very large claw compared to those on the forward directed toes. It's also strongly curved. Without this claw difference on that toe that points backwards, they would not be able to climb with their head pointing down. If you see a bird around here climbing down the face of a tree, you should likely assume that it is a white-breasted nut, nut hatch. And swimming is our last topic for this. Uh, your swimming birds are highly modified for swimming. Many of them become really bad at land-based locomotion. They have a very wide body to increase their stability in the water. They have dense plumage providing buoyancy and insulation. They're also gonna need to be fairly waterproofed. In order to get that, they have a large preening gland that produces a waterproofing oil. For your swimming and your diving birds, their legs are at the rear of the bird's body. They're not gonna be at the center and they're gonna have a very bad center of gravity. These birds, if they're capable of walking on ground, are going to look quite clumsy. Now, compared to ducks and geese, um, when we compare ducks and geese to sparrows, ducks and geese are capable of walking on the ground, yes. So when we look at things like loons, it suddenly becomes more like struggling to move any distance on the land surface. There are some hind limb modifications that are pretty obvious for our birds that swim and dive. They may have webbing between the toes and webbing is not necessarily an indication that they're in the same family. Webbing is something that is independently developed in at least four different lineages. And they may have lobed toes if they don't have complete webbing. There are about 400 species that are specialized for swimming. None of them are fully aquatic, and about half are capable of diving and swimming underwater. This is looking at the feet. A and B show webbing, whereas C, D, and E are trying to show off the concept of lobed feet. We'll pick up with digestive system next time. <laughs>